All right, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Milliken, and Mr. Smith, and pr praying for the arrival of, of uh, George Braxton. And um, I'm Ben Kamlo, chair, and Julie Tim, the CA CEO, is here with all of our excellent staff. And uh, our attorney is attending. Thank heaven. So let's uh, let's begin with public comments. Good morning, Mr. Campbell. Prior to speaking with uh, Carrie coming out and speaking, can um, we make sure that remind everyone that this is being recorded? Uh, it's being telecast virtually live, and people can watch it on YouTube. It's also being recorded, and people will be able to watch it later. Here we'll go into a couple other of uh, comments regarding the, the virtual meeting process. Do you need to say some other things about the virtual meeting process? Do we need to? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have it included in my intro statement. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Mr. Chair, we did receive public comment. For the benefit of all attendees today, I will briefly explain how to participate in public comment at board meetings. Video and audio of board meetings are streamed live online and recorded for later viewing at GRTC's YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash user backslash ride GRTC. Board meeting notices, agendas, and packets are available at GRTC's website, ridegrtc.com, by clicking on stats and reports in the top navigation bar and selecting the first option in the drop down menu, board reports. Citizens are welcome to provide their comments in writing in advance to carry.rosepace at ridegrtc.com. The person responsible for receiving comments in writing is Carrie Rose Pace, Director of Communications. All written comments received via email prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting will be provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. During the public comments portion of the agenda, Carrie Rose Pace will read all comments received by the submission deadline following the two minute speaking time limit normally observed in board meetings. This meeting, I received 12 submitted comments in writing to be read. From Carolyn Howe, I am a disabled woman who rides the care van. I'm wondering, as well as other van riders, what can be done if you report someone and they retaliate against you through their job and authority at GRTC as a dispatcher or working in that department? Is there any recourse for the victims, care van riders, of this retaliation? If the coworkers align themselves with one another and regardless of knowledge of this, choose to send a message that demonstrates, this is what you get when you have the nerve to report any mistreatment. The message and the continued abuse send a message to an already fragile population that you keep your mouth shut, be glad you have a side, and take what you get. I would love for this to be addressed at the board meeting and not treated as a fairy tale that these things don't happen. Since GRTC has already been on the news more than once for atrocities and these situations were brought to light, I'm sure only after numerous complaints being continuously ignored. I would like to know, does anyone have the compassion to stop these actions? From Michael O'Connor. I am writing to follow up on the concerns and suggestions voiced by affected fan residents. Should we expect a formal reply regarding these from management or the board? Is there a time frame when the concerns raised and suggestions made might be seriously considered? Below you will find a photo taken of the westbound bus stop at Grove and Lombardi. The car you see is parked immediately after the no parking sign installed for the bus stop. As you can see, one of the difficult to park blocks in the fan has just lost four spots. And Rob, I'm going to attempt to share my screen to show that photo. There you are. And this is the vehicle reference. All right, I'm stopping here. Again, thanks for the opportunity to have our concerns considered. Michael D. O'Connor, 1523 Grove Avenue. From Una Lochran, 1423 Grove Avenue. To the board of the GRTC, 
Day after day, hour after hour, the empty buses trundle down a residential street, a street with no businesses, a street with houses and small front yards, a street with child care facilities, a street with multiple stop signs to reduce traffic, a street where no one was asked their opinion on the introduction of a large, noisy, empty vehicles and the impact they would have on their lives and on their pockets. This bus carries no passengers because no one wants to travel on this route. This is Route 77. Two blocks away, a bus runs on a commercial street, a street with shops, a street with businesses, a street designed for commercial traffic and traffic flow, a street that provides a connection to downtown and beyond. This bus carries passengers because people want to travel this route. This is Route 5. A review of your publicly available data shows that here are four buses an hour to each direction for 12 hours every day. That is 48 buses per day, 288 buses Monday to Saturday, and another 24 buses on a Sunday. Your data also show that no more than nine people per week, yes, nine people per week, use any individual bus stop below Robinson before Route 77 converges with Route 5. The average use is below two people at any one stop per week. In summary, it appears that there are 312 buses per week serving between 10 and 20 people. Even if we double the ridership, the route does not make sense. The data do not support this part of Route 77. There is nobody riding this part of the route. It is not a coverage route. Route 5 is two blocks away. Route 5 connects commuters with downtown and beyond and is more a frequent and more utilized service. There was a reason this route was discontinued and the current data support that decision. Route 5, I believe they meant to say Route 77, is a waste of taxpayers' money and an environmental insult to our neighborhood and the city. I respectfully request an update on the review of Route 77 along with any documentation that supports the continuation of that route. Yours sincerely, Una Lofren. From Martha Quinn. The neighbors of Grove and Plum are against bus 77 continued route through the fan. Incorrect information, lies in fact, were shared in the recent Zoom public meeting. Residents were not surveyed via email or mail about opinions regarding the bus. We have personally viewed the bus traveling on Grove Avenue between North Harvey and Lombardi with no ridership. There is no demand for this bus line. However, there is deep frustration at its sudden appearance in our neighborhood. It is noisy, dirty, and intrusive. It has required removal of several parking spots that are sorely needed on Grove. I request that you please report the truth, do away with this line, and Councilwoman Gray that you support your constituents. Martha Quinn, 213 North Plum Street. From Mathis Kirby Powelson. According to your information that you sent about ridership numbers, I have calculated the following information. There are 25 buses that leave U of R per day and 25 that leave VCU per day. The peak ridership for a day was on 925, September 25th, that is, and it was 138 passengers. That comes out to 2.76 riders per bus. On October 27th, the ridership was 11 people for the day. That comes out to 0.22 riders per bus. The average ridership for the month was 83 people per day, which divided by the 50 buses is 1.6 people per bus. This is a total waste of taxpayers' money, a burden on our environment, and a danger to our road driving through the fan. These numbers simply do not justify the bus route. In addition, it is also taking away multiple parking spaces for fan residents. Please make the bus stop at Robinson and then turn. It would make much more sense for the bus to drive to Broad on Robinson and then go up Broad past retail where riders can actually shop. It could then turn down Belvedere and go past Monroe Park and then up Main Street, which again would be going to retail. It could stop on Main shortly after turning off of Belvedere and those that want to go to VCU could get out there. It could go down Main to Robinson and then once again turn to Grove and then go westbound on Grove to U of R. There's simply no reason to have it travel down a crowded neighborhood road where there is no retail. Thank you, Mathis Kirby Powelson. From Chris Berry to the GRTC Board of Directors, why do you continue to throw good taxpayer money after bad? Others have detailed using GRTC's own data how few riders make use of the new Route 77. 
Sitting near the intersection of Grove and Meadow, I can personally attest to the high number of buses I see past our house with zero or occasionally one riders, never more. Before you allow yourself to be lulled into the belief that the ridership is low because of COVID, remember that the old Route 16 was cut just two years ago and we were told it was because of low ridership. Other municipalities are reducing service to attempt to reduce costs. Why is GRTC adding unwanted based on ridership routes? Additionally, having buses going both ways on Grove where in the fan there are no commercial businesses east of retreat seems to this voter to be ludicrous. At the very least, have the buses going east on Grove, turn south at Robinson and then east on Cary, and going west, come up Main, turn at Robinson and then on Grove. This would at least take potential riders past businesses while eliminating bus congestion in the fan and freeing up parking. Incidentally, the bus loading spots on Grove and the fan are totally unnecessary. Check your own records for how many riders enter or exit. Where is all the money that you are wasting on an unwanted service coming from? Mayor Stoney, you want money for your projects. Look for the slush fund GRTC is using. Chris Berry. From Martin Murphy. Route 77 has no observable, observable ridership. It generates substantial pollution for no discernible purpose. It is a waste of taxpayers' money and a blight on the environment. It is incumbent on GRTC to explain why this continues despite the repeated appeals from concerned citizens. Martin Murphy. 2012 Grove Avenue. From GS Callings, the count continues. Since my written comments submitted for the last board meeting, I have continued my observations of the ridership on Grove Avenue. I've spent a great deal of time watching passing buses from our front porch or during frequent walks or drives up and down Grove Avenue, and I've seen no increase in the utilization of this route. I've watched during different times of day and evening, and most of the buses still remain empty or with just one passenger. Please stop this obscene waste of the taxpayer's money and its impact on pollution and climate change. If you must continue with an evaluation period, please consider a shuttle size van and route it one way on Grove and the opposite way on Hanover, as was the case for the old Route 16. This would reduce the waste somewhat, lower the carbon footprint, and split the negative impact on parking to two streets instead of concentrating it just on Grove. Respectfully, GS Collins, 1904 Grove Avenue. From Sarah Johns, as a resident and homeowner of 1512 Grove Avenue, I write in support of GRTC's reasoned expansion of bus infrastructure, including Route 77 on Grove Avenue through the fan. Our whole city benefits from bus routes that connect more neighborhoods to more businesses and commercial areas. My spouse and I commute on foot to VCU and by bus downtown, although we own cars. This additional bus service means we could also easily access Carytown shopping, library and restaurants, as well as concerts at VCU and the University of Richmond without adding more car traffic to the fans narrow streets. As a pedestrian and runner on fan streets, I fear individuals driving cars who roll through intersections because they are distracted, rushing, or can't see around parked cars. In my experience, professional GRTC drivers are alert and attentive to pedestrians in sidewalks and in the road. Rather than fearing the bus traffic on our streets, I look forward to the opportunity to reduce the car traffic on our streets by using the bus. And I encourage others to do the same. Better bus service would reduce the need for cars and possibly improve parking availability for those concerned about losing spaces to bus stops. Bus service and use could increase safety for pedestrians and reduce our environmental footprint, including traffic emissions, consistent with the sustainable development of our city. I hope it will also encourage new residents to move to the fan and visitors to support our neighborhood markets and restaurants. Thank you for your attention, Sarah Johns. From Kevin McGeorge, thank you so much for reading this email. I know that several of my neighbors have already sent in emails, so I will not go into the details of the bus route, which is implied 77. However, I simply see this as a wonderful opportunity to listen to the neighbors that live on this bus route and to stop this bus route because it is simply inefficient and a waste of money. Please see this as an opportunity to spend money elsewhere, and we are so grateful for all that you do. Stay awesome. Kevin McGeorge, 1515 Grove Avenue. From Eric Gable. 
I am a resident of the fan. I live on Plum Street, just a block from the Grove Street bus stop for the number 77 bus that runs from VCU to the University of Richmond. I am a strong proponent of public transportation, and I wish that Richmond had a more efficient system that would attract riders and serve the needs of the wider public. I also, however, am against wasteful spending. Given its extremely low ridership, the number 77 bus does not appear to be fulfilling a current need, and it clearly is an unsustainable expense while also taking up scarce parking spaces in a heavily used part of town. Will that change once the pandemic is behind us? Perhaps. But there is a good chance that at least a segment east of Robinson will never have riders. Meanwhile, there will be even more pressure for parking once the pandemic has been brought under control, and there are other options. Main Street is only a few blocks away and goes through more work-rich areas and could be rethought to carry the burden of the Grove route. Thank you, Eric Gable. From Liz Williamson, 1507 Grove Avenue. I am strongly opposed GRTC's decision adding two-way bus service on Grove Avenue in the fan area due to significantly diminished pedestrian safety, reduced parking, and increased noise and pollution. These sizable negative impacts are not justified by the lack of ridership for the route. I listened to the October board meeting's discussion of Route 77 and neighbor concerns. I was extremely disappointed that it appeared that the GRTC leadership dismissed concerns with conclusory statements, such as the route is safe, the road is wide enough, and the route is justified by a gap in service area. I was extremely offended by the notion offered by Ms. Tim that residents just want to be heard. I can assure the board that yes, residents want to be heard, but more importantly, residents want GRTC to reconsider Route 77. We want this to happen before there is a pedestrian fatality in our area. I appreciated one of the board members' suggestions to evaluate safety of the route. Thank you for taking our concerns seriously. However, I would propose taking additional steps to evaluate safety prior to an accident occurring. GRTC should consider the following in its safety evaluation. One. Buses are unsafely navigating frequent lane blockages due to double parking. Double parking is necessary on Grove due to the lack of street parking, particularly in the lower fan near VCU. This use of Grove continues. This past Saturday evening after nightfall, November the 14th, the westbound lane of, of Grove was blocked for almost 15 minutes by a passenger car with its hazard lights on. A GRTC bus did not even slow down. The bus went into the opposite lane without lowering its speed. Lanes are blocked on a regular basis. These safety concerns will be even more dramatic when the VC student community comes back into the lower fan post COVID-19. There will be even fewer parking spaces and therefore more double parking. Two, speed. Buses are traveling at unsafe speeds on Grove in areas in which there are many children on bikes and crosswalks and two daycare centers. Three, lack of space. Grove does not have the space to safely accommodate two buses and parked cars on both sides of the street. It would be easy for a person exiting a parked car to open her door into a speeding bus. The spatial issues are particularly an issue for the lower fan. Unlike Grove in the museum district, the higher density population and students create more pedestrians getting into and out of cars that are sharing space with buses. Four, lack of visibility. Extending service on this route until 10 p.m. in 2022 is extremely problematic. My block of Grove is not well lit. There is an accident waiting to happen once you add the student population in dark winter months to the equation on our streets. The residents on Grove continue to see empty or virtually empty buses travel every 20 minutes down Grove. How can GRTC possibly weigh the lack of use of this route against safety considerations? We are not opposed to public transportation. I've heard the passionate appeals that wish to have fan bus service expanded. I'm not against the bus service. However, overburdening one fan street is problematic on many levels. It would be easy for GRTC to look at other route options if it is married to Route 77 service. At the very least, take riders down Grove only one direction, similar to the prior Grove route, or alternatively have buses turn to Cary or Main before getting to the lower fan where the population density, increased pedestrian traffic and double parking issues are the worst. We have noted that Main Street is only two blocks from Grove in the lower fan. In summary, there are reasons to discontinue this route and identify a solution to safely provide transportation to address the need GRTC has identified for the fan area. We should not overburden one street. 
Route 77 is clearly unjustified and should be immediately discontinued. GRTC, please make the right choice and choose safety first. Very truly yours, Liz Williamson. Mr. Chair, this concludes all the public comments submitted. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rose Pace. Um, Ms. Tim, you have anything to say on this? So we just go forward? Yes, sir. Um, specifically regarding the comment on the ADA issue, um, while we can't go into the necessarily the personal details of the, the writer who complained, we do take those complaints very seriously. Uh, our, our highest leadership team has been in contact with her to, to make sure that she is taken care of. Her comments and her concerns are taken very seriously. Um, the words that she uses to describe her complaint are, um, are, are very serious and significant words when anyone uses the word retaliation. Uh, there's also ways that anyone who does have a complaint can compl uh, submit comments formally and officially all the way to the Federal Transit Administration to ensure uh, that there isn't retaliation and their comments are formally heard. Um, we'll make sure that she has all the resources at her disposal to, to address her concerns um, uh, respectfully and seriously. And Tim and Carrie and Cheryl and myself will continue to respond to make sure that, uh, that this isn't an, uh, uh, this isn't uh, an issue that continues uh, and that it's not an ongoing issue. While I understand that some of the claims that she's made in her, her comment are very serious, I, some of them also I can't say that we have been in the news for ADA noncompliance. We have had very good ADA record in the past year since I've been here and I have not seen anything in the record since before that. So I understand that, um, that she does have complaints and we take them seriously and we'll follow up. Regarding the 77, um, those uh, complaints, I understand that there are residents who continue to have concerns on that. As promised, we will have a report later this uh, board regarding the um, KPIs, key performance indic indicators of all of our routes, including the Route 77, how we're monitoring them and how we're assessing uh, their, their performance to those KPIs and their longevity in the, the entire system. So we will continue to monitor that as promised and make good judgments on how the system interconnects based on the needs of each route and the residents we serve. That's, uh, that's good as my, and there's a good report later. It, it is, um, we have an orderly process for, for evaluating uh, this route and all of our routes and, and we intend to do so. So um, that, uh, that's our response and, and we mean to do it seriously. The, um, we now move to a, a kind of a special meeting inserted into this board meeting, which is, <clears throat> which deals with the annual shareholders meeting of GRTC, which was held on November 6, 2020. The city of Richmond uh, was represented by Councilwoman Ellen Robertson, the County of Chesterfield by a County Attorney, Christopher Midgley. And the city of Richmond, um, which is the half owner of GRTC, reappointed Benjamin Campbell, George Braxton, and Eldridge Coles to the board of GRTC for another one-year term. Counter Chesterfield reappointed Gary Armstrong, Ian Milligan, and Daniel Smith uh, for a one-year term through October 2021. Um, so that's a report to you about that, um, which means that uh, we're all sitting here now as the board members for this coming year. And um, Mr. Braxton has a, a report from the nominating committee for the GRTC Board of Directors. Sure. Um, the nominating committee met virtually in my head and um, <laughs> um, reached out to members of the board, um, all of whom have been reappointed. And the nominating committee um, brings forth the slate of um, proposed officers of Benjamin Campbell. Um, for chairman of the board. Um, vice chairman would be um, Gary Armstrong, Chesterfield, and secretary would be Eldridge Coles of Richmond. Thank you for that report. Are there any other nominations for these offices? All right, George, uh, your that report is a, is a, uh, is a motion yeah. that uh, these people be elected. I submit my uh, report um, as a motion uh, to be voted on. So I move 
the slate. All right. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that uh, Benjamin Campbell continue this next year as chair of the board, that Gary Armstrong be vice chair, that Eldridge Coles uh, be secretary. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Uh, it is so, it is done. So now we proceed. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to all you folks. Um, and we have the minutes. So uh, I'd like to approve <clears throat> the minutes and any corrections first or additions. If not, could we have a motion to approve them, please? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that the minutes of the previous meeting be approved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is so ordered. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a report from Ms. Torres on uh, the Central Virginia Transit Authority. Adrian, Good morning. Hi. Yeah, I am here. All right, a quick update um, on the CBTA. Um, lots of progress since the last board meeting. Um, one of the topics that's been covered is the regional public transportation plan. Uh, it, the $200,000 request of the 15% trans, transit funds was approved by the CBTA on October 30th. Um, GRTC has also been working um, with Plan RVA and we have decided to move forward with Michael Baker International and Jarrett Walker and Associates after reviewing two proposals. Um, we are still moving pretty fast with that. Uh, we plan to have our kickoff meeting pretty soon. Um, we were hoping for the first half of November, so hopefully within the next week or so. And the draft FY22 alternative, uh, our target completion date is December 31st, with the final plan completion date by March 31st. Now that's the is that your transit development or is that the um that's the um governance isn't it no this is the regional public transportation plan so okay. this is for um grtc's kind of fy22 operating so those deadlines are the 31st of december and march 31st yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah originally it was the end of june but we changed it to be in line with budget okay um, also meeting was the CBTA TAC. We discussed the regional public transportation plan as well and the, pro the process. The other two topics covered um, was the regional, sorry, the regional public transportation plan. But we also discussed the regional prior, prioritization process for the 35% transportation funds. Um, we also discussed update on the transit service governance report. And we did uh, recommend the scope of work and the draft letter to go to CBTA um, and that will be on there December 4th for approval and that's for the scope. Uh, the target completion date for that is March 31st as well with the final date of completion um, by the end of the fiscal year of June 30th. Uh, they still have a target of the strategic assessment of GRTC's governance structure by the end of November and then options for potential transit governance strategies is the end of December. Again, I said that they, um, changed it so that the hard deadline is the end of June rather than March 31st, with the goal still being March 31st. Yeah, and that November date got moved off because they haven't approved it yet. So um, I sent this morning, I sent uh, to all board members um, a copy of the 12 page scope of work that was approved by the TAC for the study of governance for GRTC. and. Um, you know, as I've said to you before, it's uh, it's going to have major impact on us, and we will ultimately, um, as as the owners of GRTC or as the board of GRTC, have to act on recommendations that come. So, uh, and hopefully, that is my hope that all of us, if we wish, will have an opportunity to speak with the consultants um, in this process. The consultants won't be chosen till after the December 4th meeting, correct, of the CBTA uh, board, uh, which has to approve the, the TAC report. Correct, yes. So December 4th, they'll approve the scope and then they can move forward with the DRPT bench contract for consultant selection. Yeah, which they will do pretty promptly, I'm thinking. So uh, please read it. Um, I think you'll see 
um, you know, how uh, broad ranging and intentional it is. And it is, um, it is our, it will affect us uh, significantly as we go forward here. What, any questions or other things? Adrian, do you want to say anything else on this? Uh, I was just going to give the next date. That's okay. it. Um, the finance meeting did, uh, committee did meet on November 9th and they did recommend for adoption the operating expense budget. And then the next meeting, the CVTA TAC is having a special meeting on November 20th. And then the normal meeting is to set for December 7th. The finance committee meeting um, next one is scheduled for December 9th. And then we are discussed the CBTA meeting is December 4th. What are you doing the 4th of uh, uh, the 20th of November for that special meeting? Um, that is to continue to discuss. Um, actually, I can't think of the topic right now. Sorry. Um, if any of you wish to. Um, watch these meetings they're on the uh, youtube channel of, uh, of plan rva and um i'm sure uh, someone would be glad to send you the link to them any further comments or questions mr chairman if i may please um just wanted to make a comment that uh, uh that i do sit on the cbta board as a representative for grtc uh, per the legislation and wanted to kind of give a shout out to that board that they are being while the process is being very slow and getting set up in a lot of ways, it's being very intentional and very considerate that they want to make sure that they do it right, that they don't do it quickly. I think that's a repeated phrase that they use um, many times. And, and I think that's reflected in the slowing down of this governance report as well to get through the process, to make sure they get the scope right, and to make sure that they do have all parties included and they make good recommendations. So. I'm very proud to sit on that board and, and very pleased to see that they are making very considered and deliberative actions. Thank you. It's, um, you know, it's a very important baby that's being birthed here and um, we pray that it will in fact eventuate in a, in a, a healthier and expanded um, transportation system with the quality that GRTC currently has. Mr. Chairman. Well, Yes. Yeah, I just want to make the statement, you know, as I sort of look through this, um, you know, I, I, for a living, what I do is, is change, you know, I'm a change agent. And the one thing I always tell people is that, um, you know, change is always good. It's just not always good for everybody. And um, that's just something we have to keep in the back of our minds as we go through this process. I mean, it definitely seems that there are some changes coming. Um, I think ultimately, um, across the board, it you know will always be good. Um, it's just not good for everybody. And our role, of course, is um, you know a fiduci our fiduciary responsibility is GRTC. We got to make sure that that change is good for GRTC. But change change is definitely coming. And um, you know, just looking at you know, just scanning over the first part of this document. Um, as you said, um, things are very intentional. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, um, and thank you. Uh, we are so ably represented by Ms. Torres uh, in these meetings. Um, she, uh, she doesn't let much go by her. And uh, <laughs> it, is a, <clears throat> it is a source of, of accurate information um, without which good decisions would not be made. Um, okay, let's see, Julie, is this um, Orvan, uh, Association for Commuter Transportation, Ms. Tisdale? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. What we have before us is uh, from the Association for Commuter Transportation, which is an agency that's very similar to APSA, how APSA is transit, that's how it is for the TDM agency. And every year during its annual forum, it recognizes uh, young professionals under the age of 40 who make outstanding contributions to the TDM industry. And we're very honored and proud to announce that RideFinder's Client Services Coordinator, Jakima Taylor, is one of the recipients of this prestigious award this year. She's been with RideFinder's um, over 14 years and does a myriad of uh, job performances and functions that may fall under um, other categories. And um, 
So we're very proud that she's been a winner. I won't list all the things she's done as listed on the report, but I'll sum it up by saying these achievements in sustainability, excellent customer service, and the impact on the region have enriched the lives of our commuters and the viability of Thrive Finders. We call her our gentle soul with extremely good customer service and patience, and we're very proud uh, that she has been recognized. And she received that award on November 10th through a virtual appreciation. Oh, thank you. Um, well, congratulations to Ms. Taylor and um, uh, what, how, how exciting to have her recognized in this fashion. That's wonderful. Yeah, I like that too, George. Thank you. There we are. Come on, Danny, get those paws up there. <laughs> All right, that's great. We'll share that with her. Please do. Um, and please give her our thanks for, um, for, her, uh, for her work and her fidelity. Um, this, thank, you. thank you. All right. Um, now we move on to operations reports. So, uh, uh, Mr. Barno, Barham, I think uh, you're up. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first, just want to get a view of the KPIs uh, for lost trips this past month. We were at 670 uh, compared to September 49. Uh, so we operated at about 98.90%, um, which is about where we were a little more than what we were last month. Uh, so the lost trips pretty much remained steady. Uh, absenteeism rate uh, was at 15.07%, uh, which was uh, more than what we had in September, which was 10.65%. Uh, the main reason for the rise of absenteeism, uh, we had an increase in long-term uh, illnesses, um, workers' comp, uh, a few holdovers from uh, COVID-related uh, instances and so forth. Um, uh, but we are managing it as best we can to make sure we do uh, keep as many trips out there and as much service as we can. Uh, we continue to use operator overtime, uh, supervisors, and, and so forth. Uh, customer complaints uh, were at 1.65 per 10,000 riders uh, compared to 1.21 from this past month, from September rather. Uh, we did see an increase in certain types of complaints, um, you know, rude drivers, some mask issues and so forth. Uh, but uh, what also happens is that as the uh, ridership increases, uh, proportionately, uh, complaints tend to go up as well. Uh, so we'll keep monitoring it, make sure that we uh, follow through and investigate each complaint, uh, pull the DVR footage uh, and address them appropriately. Uh, Next, I'll go over the FITS report, and I will uh, attempt to share that, and it's on page 33 of your board packet. I think I have it up now. Uh, for the ridership, compared to last month, we were at, uh, for fixed route service, we were down 5.10% compared to last month at 4%. Uh, Pulse was down 43.7% uh, compared to 42%. Uh, Commuter Express down 75% uh, compared to 79.78. Uh, and then combined fixed route service down 17.75% compared to 16.74. Uh, care service was down 23.45% compared to September 29.04. Uh, care on demand service down 28.12 uh, compared to 22.44. And the overall service uh, was down a little under 18%, 17.94. Uh, and looking at the fiscal year so far, we're down uh, about 20, a little under 20%, 19.94. Uh, Vancouver, and that was, you're saying that the, our service is down less than it was last month? Compared yeah, to last year, yes. Right, okay. Yes. Uh, and then I, I was mentioning Vanpool uh, down, um, well, through September, uh, down 70.26%. And just to give you those fiscal year numbers, uh, I think this may help explain also, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we were at uh, fiscal year 20, uh, this time last year at 3.3 million in terms of ridership. This year, uh, through the month of October, we're at 2.67 million. So you, that kind of gives you a little better gauge of where we are. Uh, compared to last month, month to month, 
Uh, ridership in September was at 696,759 and October was 722,600. So there's been a steady climb in ridership and, and still down from last year, uh, but we're still noticing you know, that steady climb uh, as we go from month to month uh, compared to where we were when uh, the pandemic first started. Uh, specialized transportation, uh, on-time performance was at 90.51% uh, compared to last month or September where it's at 92%. Uh, complaints uh, went up also or at 11 uh, compared to four for September and, and similar uh, situation that I described in fixed route. Um, as the ridership goes up, you know, we do have, uh, you know, several more complaints. Uh, some of them were um, non-valid. Some of them were valid. We addressed those accordingly. Uh, but some of the same situ scenarios, uh, you know, operator complaints and things of that nature. Uh, we did have three accommodations uh, for this past month in Spectran, which was the same uh, in September. As far as any COVID, um, initiatives or related items from this past month, uh, do have a bit of good news. We went the entire month of October uh, without a single new reported positive case. Uh, we did have some from, uh, from September that kind of carried over, uh, but we didn't have any for the month of October. Uh, we did have one case, uh, a contract employee uh, that did test positive and that person is doing, uh, doing okay. Um, so we're looking at, you know, roughly about six, seven weeks, only one new case. How are we doing with mask behavior on the part of our riders? We still have, you know, some customers here and there and some issues uh, that the supervisors uh, go to on the scene to address. And in some cases even have to um, get assistance from the police. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, funny you should mention that because this past uh, Sunday with the governor's mandate, uh, the mask uh, requirement for age-wise has been reduced from age 10 to age five. So we had to put that out to make sure folks understood that as well. Uh, but like I said, we're still enforcing it. Uh, we still make sure that we have plenty of supplies on hand. So we have, we have masks to give out for those persons who don't have any. Uh, and for the operators, uh, we do have plenty of supplies as far as um, the spray, disinfectant sprays, uh, wipes and so forth, the maintenance staff, uh, you know, they do a job every night, making sure that they disinfect the buses as well. Um, and, and like I said, we've been fortunate compared to um, what's been going on around the country uh, and even within our own industry uh, as far as um, COVID related cases. So we'll continue to push those initiatives. Make sure we have plenty of supplies on hand um, for our customers and for our employees. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Mm. I, I had planned to also address this a bit in my CEO report since you asked the question here to follow up with what Tim said. Um, there is a good compliance amongst a lot of our, our riders. However, we do continue to have the operators. The burden of enforcing it does fall on our operators and uh, that can be challenging uh, as not, not all of our riders uh, are respectful or courteous. So we need to make sure that for those who are not wearing the mask, we continue to spread the message, we continue to spread the enforcement, we continue to beg, plead, whatever it takes to make sure that people know that they need to wear the mask, their mask on the bus and not just on the bus, before they get on and until they get off, mask is required on transit. And wherever we can enforce that message, we need to continue to enforce it and elevate it. And, and we're doing our part and our operators are doing a hero's job addressing people who, who don't wanna wear masks. Uh, but it is a challenge to get that 100% enforcement. Thank you. I'd like to chime in on that as well. Go ahead. You know, it's not a fashion statement. It's protection for yourself, the operator, and the other users of the service. So please, I beg of you, wear your mask. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I do have one other thing, just one little quick um, notes as well. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to conclude my report. Yes, sir. Uh, for staffing, we are currently at 270 full-time operators, 18 part-time operators. Um, our budget numbers are 290 and 26. Uh, four operators are currently in training, which should be concluded next month, uh, by the middle or the end of next month. Uh, we have a new operator class of five 
uh, that will start uh, on the 30th. Uh, we did have uh, quite a bit of a response from um, some of the ads and so forth. So I wanna thank Carrie uh, and her staff as well as uh, Human Resources uh, for the recruitment efforts uh, as we go into this uh, fall and winter season, which usually is a uh, challenge when it comes to recruitment. You know, we did have 49 applications come through. Uh, about 13 of those people uh, did indicate to us that they came as a result of watching um, our ads on TV. Uh, about another 13 or so uh, came via the website. So those were the two highest respondents uh, as far as those candidates that came through uh, the last round of interviews. Uh, and also still have in the maintenance department, um, certain positions we're still trying to fill, one in general utility, um, three mechanics and, and a bus cleaner. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions? Thanks very much, um, Ms. Barr. Our next um, item here is um, safety performance, Mr. Carter. Good morning, everyone. Um, According to the agenda, if you look on page 35 and 36, you'll see the safety performance in your board packet. I'm going to read over some highlights of that. If you wish to follow along. Um, starting off with total amount of accidents, we did see a decreasing number from October to uh, from September to October. In September, we had 39 accidents. In October, we had 30. Uh, miles between preventable accidents. In September, we drove 33,610. In October, we drove 42,776 miles. Miles between total accidents. In September, we drove 12,065 miles. In October, we were able to go 15,684 miles. Um, in September, we had a total of 14 preventable accidents. And in October, we had 11. And in September, we had a total of 22 non-preventable accidents. In October, we had 19. So far as the type of accidents that we have, we still have a high number in the amount of accidents between non-GRTC vehicles, basically collisions with other vehicles. Um, Cheryl and I had pleasure attending Virginia Transit Liability Pool Board meeting a couple weeks ago. And one of the better parts of the meeting, one of the good parts of the meeting was we were able to have a discussion with other transit agencies across the state and just see what type of trends and everything was going on so far as accidents. The trend that's going on around the state, we're finding that um, operators are being involved in accidents with other vehicles at no fault of the operators. It's just a sense of recklessness, uh, vehicles are driving at high speeds, and that's things that we're finding that's going on across the across the state. Um, we're gonna to continue to remind operators of their safety techniques. Um, training staff is in the field reminding individuals, supervisors are in the field remind, reminding operators to continue with those safety techniques um, to keep everyone as safe as possible. As well as I mentioned in the last meeting, we started a virtual training, another virtual training that's a refresh, refresher training, as well as a de-escalation video that the operators are watching. Um, the refresher training is sort of a defensive driving uh, technique. It is interactive. They do have to take a quiz at the end of it. And the operators that are actually coming in and taking it, I'm getting nothing but good feedback from them. They're saying that they enjoying it. They're learning some things. And you can tell that they're catching on and going through it a lot quicker than the initial virtual training started. So as the operators continue to get used to the virtual um, learning platform, I think that will be nothing but um, a success the operators so far as the training. Moving forward, what we hope to do is um, use some of our training staff and our own personnel to actually create videos where we can upload to the virtual learning platform and put more of that GRTC type feel on things so it'd be more personal and have a better understanding for the operators. Other than that, if there are no questions, that, that concludes my safety report. Any Mr. questions Kim, to Mr. Carter? Yes. Uh, if Julie. I may um, add on to uh, what Tony said, and I, I appreciate how he's following through with a lot of not only looking at these national trends, but also following up with our operators for how they're they're doing with our training. Um, when he talked about the the accidents, we're seeing the increase in accidents or the the change in accidents through no fault of the operators. Really, um, what we're finding is. 
when we say no fault of the operators, what we mean is that drivers are actually running into our buses. I don't know how they didn't see them, but somehow people don't see our buses when they run into them or they decide that they want to cut in front of them to try and take the left turn in front of them uh, or other unsafe uh, driving practices. So um, part of what we're going to have to do is, is work with VDOT or other places outside of GRTC to continue to support the message of don't drive distracted um, and, and do our part to try and spread that message as well. And, and as far as what Tony said, I, I want to kind of also uh, provide some kudos to that the, the, the training that, that he and his team are putting out. Um, as he's heard from uh, operators about that uh, de-escalation training, um, I believe that what I've also heard is that for those who have taken it, they feel like it's giving them extra tools to be able to manage some of the non-mask wearers and how to control and, and how they can react in the face of uh, some downright vicious uh, verbal attacks. So um, while they should never have to face that, it's good that we can give them tools for how to deal with it. And thank you, Tony, for, for putting that out there for our team. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carter, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you for your report. Um, Ms. Torres. Hello again. Hello. I will be reporting on a new performance metrics report um, that this will be quarter one. This is something that we actually started pre uh, Richmond Transit Network plan as well as um, the polls to begin to look at uh, these performance metrics. Um, but once they were implemented, we had big changes um, and we said that we were not going to make um, the major changes until things had been in place about 18 months to two years. Well, that time has gone by. So we want to start looking at it um, as a whole a little bit more transparently um, with the jurisdictions, with the board, how we're doing performance-wise. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share the report and go over the structure and how we plan to move forward. Sorry about that. Thank you guys. All right, so lots of colors and lots of um, transit language. Um, so the first one is our bus rapid transit. So they are built into categories. Um, we'll have the first one BRT and the description of the category for this one is a route that runs along a major corridor of thoroughfare and operates at high frequencies and capacities. The terminus stops are major activity centers and route intersections. So there's only one route at this point in time in this category, but we hope as we continue to grow that there will be other pulse lines um, to join our current line on Broad Street. So I'm going to use this to just describe what the different metrics are. So you have um, ridership and what ridership is by quarter is just the three month aggregate. We have our revenue hours and what this is is in service hours run by that route. So from if you're looking at a trip from the first stop, to the last stop is considered in service. Same thing with revenue miles, in service miles um, for that particular route. And again, those are totals for the first three months. And then we have something called productivity category. Um, and in here we have passenger hours and that takes from the first one, just taking the total ridership and dividing it by total hours. Same thing with passenger miles, taking the total ridership and dividing by revenue miles. And then we have what is total cost per passenger. Um, and this is an estimate for cost. Um, it's basically raw cost, taking the total amount of miles. And then we are multiplying that, what we're using as a planning level number. At this point, it's $8.13 per mile um, to estimate what it costs for that route for that quarter. And so the total cost per passenger is $3.07 for the pulse. And then passengers per trip, and this is taking, again, um, the total amount of passengers and the total amount of trips ran within that three-month span um, to give you 18.35. So on-time performance, the goal for the system is 80%. Um, and up at the top right corner, you'll see it's currently it's 66% for the quarter. Um, so we are 
on the watch. Um, so we are trying to improve that consistently. The on-time performance for the poles is actually 90%, um, and this is also the same for the express route. So moving on to the next category is arterial. In the Ralph Smith crowd category, travel more than 50% of the route on major corridor thoroughfares um, and stops are major activity centers. So you'll see here, these are pretty much our busiest routes, you could say. You have all of the ones that go up Chamberlain and Hole Street, the twos that go up North Avenue, um, Belt Boulevard and Forest Hill, um, the Jeff Davis routes that go up Highlands. Um, we have our Cary route, Maine and Wickham, which is our Route 5. Um, our Hermitage and East Main route, Broad Street, our nine mile route that goes from the city into Henrico, and then um, the West Broad Street, which goes out to Short Pump. So I'm going to take the opportunity here to just show you a red route. So Broad Street, the Route 50. This, like I said, is the first quarter. We put our changes in, major changes actually, um, for this route on September 12th. So those will be captured the next quarter. Um, and looking at performance for this, we have been looking at this for about the last two years, that this route was designed to be an arterial route. However, only one end, which was Willow Lawn, actually was in an activity center. The other one went to DMV. So in the new change, we actually have extended the route to go all the way to um, downtown. So now it will have an activity center on both ends. It also serves as kind of that local route underneath the poles. We know that there's some wider stations about a mile actually um, on Broad Street between BU and Allison Street station. This route now covers that area, which includes grocery stores. So we've already seen an increase in use for this route. So we're hoping that it will go from red um, to hopefully green would be nice, but at least yellow as it um, increases in performance and use as we've made major change. So, so this is an example of what we're looking at for making improvements. This is baseline, this is quarter one. Um, and we'll continue to look at this um, for improvement as we move forward with any other routes. So, so Adrian, um, you yeah. know, I'm not, I've, I really question whether that ought to be categorized as an arterial route. It, it, it was put in um, deliberately to enable people who had local trips along Broad Street, um, which needed uh, more frequent stops to be able to use it. And the arterial route on Broad Street is the pulse. Um, so I, I mean, it seems to me that this is more of a coverage route. At least I think we ought to think about it that way. Um, Cause I know, I'm, I mean, I know why we put it in. I know the, the public comments and needs that we were responding to um, as we developed it. And um, it's an interesting, it's an unusual route because it actually duplicates um, a, a significant arterial route that we have. Yeah, that is a good point too. Like I said, this is base um, and this isn't the only one like that. There's other routes where we kind of took an effort to, even before the RTMP um, launched or the new system, putting them in categories based on where they traveled. But I think there will be movement as we can continue to look at this. Well, maybe that's not the purpose of this route. So maybe we will move that one into maybe a community radio or more of a connector route. Um, and I think a big piece of that, uh, Reverend Kimmel, would be the frequency. The frequency for that route is a little bit less than some of these other routes. So maybe it does belong, we'll add that attribute in. So maybe it goes another category because of its um, frequency level. So we'll continue to review and you'll probably end up seeing some recategorization based on how they're actually utilized. Um, but yeah, I mean, that one definitely stands out in this category. The rest. I mean, you can see they're, they're heavily used just by the total cost per passenger hour. And these routes are high in frequency um, and go pretty far, but you can see they're, they're pretty green across the board. Um, all right, the next category, I'll, I'll jump down. Um, community radio. So routes in this category serve as the neighborhood network. These routes travel to the neighborhoods for the majority of their service connecting neighborhoods to main corridors. Um, so you'll have our Churchill route, um, the Orbital, which is the Route 20 that goes from north side down to south side, um, kind of through um, the museum district, uh, Patterson route, our Grove route, um, Cary Maimon, um, Bellmead Hopkins south side route, uh, South Laburnum, Patterson Parham, and then the new Route 1, uh, 111, and um, routes in these categories 
you'll see that there are two, again, the 76 and 77, and those routes actually did, as well as the 50, had major changes on September 12th. So again, this is baseline. This is what we were kind of looking at from the 77 and knew that something needed to be done um, because the way that it was done, designed, it served um, going from Willow Lawn, up Grove, uh, and it also served Street Shop. And it wasn't being heavily utilized there because it needed to have a second activity center. So now we are serving U of R as well as uh, Monroe Campus, serving those neighborhoods. And we will continue to monitor this if it continues to be red and yellow. Um, we will recommend changes um, in the future. And so same with the 70 Specifically, that's referring to something that we have already acted to uh, to change. Exactly. The 50, the 77, and the 76, we have already recommended changes and put them in place. And now we're at the point of watching. Thank you. Um, and the 111 is, is improving. It has uh, passengers per trip, 11.67, which is pretty good. Um, and 4.65 passengers per hour. Um, and that total cost per passenger actually has been coming down the more riders we get on the route. And then um, circulator feeder connector, um, a smaller category. Uh, we have our Montrose and Darby Town routes in the East End, um, as well as the Oakwood route in the East End. And those are smaller routes that connect primarily to the pulse station. We have the Broad Rock route, um, the Belt, Bells and Ruffin route, that one connects um, Southside Plaza to Phillips Morris. We have our Henrico Government Center route that also goes to Amtrak, um, Libertum connector, and then also the Azalea connector. And um, these routes, I mean, we're, we're still watching the 88 and the 18. We know those both serve a purpose and their frequencies are already are pretty low. Um, so they are definitely coverage routes that, that serve a purpose of actually accessing things for jobs. And moving down, our last one. Our express route. We have um, the Henrico routes to 23, to 26, to 27. We normally have the 28, um, but that has been temporarily discontinued because of COVID. Um, the 29 and the 64 is City of Richmond route. Chesterfield is the 82, and then the 95 is Petersburg. The 23 is a route that has very few trips. So that one is, is typically um, one that is red. It kind of complements the other route. And then the 95 um, has a good amount of, of passengers. However, um, the route itself is just far. So it's just expensive in terms of cost because of the miles. And um, I want to just Acknowledge here, the, the passengers per trip have been um, run by specialized transportation. So this data is being captured by a fixed route buses. So that is why that's not shown. Same with the on-time performance. This is uh, automatically captured through our AVL system. Um, and speaking of on-time performance, it doesn't look great. However, um, we have already taken a deep dive into the trip level and um, operator level to see what we can find out. We've already seen some some trends. Actually, some of it may be related to just the way that the routes are, are coded within our software. So we're hoping that might fix some things. And then other things, um, just note that on-time performance does not mean a route is necessarily late. It also means a route could be early. If a route is um, greater than one minute early or greater than five minutes late, and this is based on departure, then it's considered um, basically on time performance. It's not on time. So individuals on the bus uh, may benefit from the route being early, but individuals at a bus stop waiting for it um, may be there five minutes early waiting for the bus and the bus may have already passed. So that still impacts our reliability in terms of um, riding the bus. So we still want to be able to fix those. So we're looking at the running times now to make sure um, if a bus is scheduled to make between two stops and 12 minutes, but it's doing it in five, we're making small tweaks like that and we'll continue to monitor it so we can continue to improve our on-time performance. Hopefully one day hit that goal of 80%. Any questions? Uh, that's an excellent, um, I think this is gonna be really helpful, um, Adrian. Um, isn't it as we as we continue to work on <clears throat> and doing what we do well and uh, and properly allocating our resources? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's red and yellow, but it's not a bad thing. This just shows us that we have work to do um, and yeah. we can actually do a strategy to improve it. 
Exactly. Are there any other questions um, or comments on this report? All right, thank you. I find that report really helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So now we have some action items. <clears throat> um, beginning with uh, landscaping and lawn service. Is Joey Agee here? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so these are the um, landscaping services for the BRT. Uh, the design of the stations along the BRT uh, transit systems include landscaping areas that require consistent landscaping services. The contractor is responsible to provide labor, materials, equipment, and tools to service these stations. The previous contractor was awarded this contract for $86,515. The contractor fees could not cover the expenses uh, that would be able to perform the services, causing the contractor unable to hold up their end of the agreement, resulting in terminating their agreement as a result. Staff issued a request for proposals with the independent cost estimate for this project being 386,535 over a five year period. Staff issued a request for proposals on July 23rd, 2020. Five proposals were received and evaluated based on the firm's qualifications and capabilities, related experiences and references, technical proposals and price. Staff did determine that Integrity and Freeman's proposals appeared to be less than the expenses that would be incurred to perform the services. <laughs> Turf and Ware were provided with a best and final offer. While Ware's best and final offer was slightly higher, staff did determine that Ware was the highest ranked proposer based on performance and reference checks. This agreement is structured for a one year base term with four optional years for a total of five years. This purchase will be funded with operational funds that fall within or under the approved operating budget of general maintenance BRT stations. The recommendation is that the board of directors authorizes the CEO to execute a contract for the BRT Pulse Landscaping Services with Ware Lawn Care and General Services Inc. for the one, one year base term with four one year optionals for a total contract value not to exceed $303,100. Thank you, Mr. Ag. Are there any questions um, to this? Or Real quick, the um, the recommendation includes three hundred three thousand, but the best final offer was two ninety six. Is that just a? Yes, two ninety six. You are correct. Two ninety six, three sixty. So why was the difference there? We'll. I think that was a, a typo. Uh, our apologies. That should be the two hundred ninety-six three hundred and sixty for the action. So we are. Um, our action will be for two ninety-six three hundred and sixty, not three hundred three one hundred. Yes, sir. Joey and Tanya, is that correct? Yes. All right. Could I have a motion to approve this um, recommendation at two hundred ninety-six thousand? Three. All right. Move. Second. Wave second, I need a second. Anybody awake? I'm mute here, second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, it's been, it's been approved. Mr. Ag, thank you very much for that report. Thank you. All right. Uh, Enterprise Resource Planning Consultant, uh, Mr. Taggart. Good morning. Good morning. So starting back in the early 2000s, GRTC began using Microsoft Great Plains for their financial uh, work as well as limited HR work. Um, GRTC desires to grow that into a full enterprise resource planning system, ERP for short. So as I talk about ERP, I mean inter enterprise resource planning. So with that in mind and, and the scope of this project, we decided to take a phased approach to this project to ensure that our needs are met and that we deploy the correct system. So the, the first step of this is the uh, enterprise resource planning consultant that we put out an RFP for here a few months ago. We had 18 respondents to this RFP. And after extensive evaluation, we determined that Plant and Moran was the most suited candidate and best respondent to this project. There will be two phases. Phase one is a quick summary for you. Phase one is where they will do an evaluation of our current systems and our business practices. Um, taking that evaluation, they will look at our existing system to see if it can meet our needs with the proper implementation. 
or if we need to replace it with another system. At the end of phase one, they will assist GRTC in creating a RFP for the full ERP system and installation or implementation. During phase two of this project is when we will go into the actual implementation of that system is, and all the associated pieces of it. And Plant Moran will then be our advocate working alongside of us <coughs> to ensure that the system is implemented correctly and the business processes are put in place that go along with that system. Um, this is a federal and state funded project. Um, so just to reiterate, this consultant is our advocate uh, throughout the whole process. They will not be selling or implementing the actual software. Um, the recommendation to the board of directors is to authorize the CEO to execute the agreement with Plant Moran for phase one and two. The cost of that total agreement will be $510,305. However, we are only issuing a purchase order for phase one at this time, which is $142,740 for phase one. Total cost independent estimate for this project is around 2.6 million. And as we move forward into phase two, we will be applying for the necessary funding to cover phase two of the, the project. Could you explain what an enterprise resource planning thing is? Sure. An ERP software is the software that basically runs your entire organization. It covers finance, it covers human resources, it covers procurement, inventory tracking, replenishment of that inventory, <laughs> the business processes of paying invoices and how all that flows through the system, um, as well as uh, in our case, since we're government, it would also work to uh, do our grant management as well. So it's on the it's on the house side as opposed to the operational side of the. It, it pretty much will touch almost everyone, but it's focused more on the house side and running of the business and keeping all of those processes organized throughout the whole organization. Are there any other questions? Hey Rob, why are the variance in prices when I looked at it? Yeah, that's my question as well. Um, they all came in. They all have different rates for their people, and so this is all. They're all consulting companies. So the majority of that price variance is what they charge per hour. I also wanted to make a note that I kind of skipped over that this, this uh, group, Plant Moran, also has, a, has included a subcontractor that includes some DBE and SWAM participation as well on this project. But the, the variation of prices, we were surprised by that as well, but it all boils down to what they charge per hour for their people. So it's just labor costs. Yes, sir. Anybody else? And Point so fee structure was taken into account. Looks like uh, weighting 20% into the valuation. Correct. More critical to us was not just fee structure, but as well as their experiences and qualifications. And Plant Moran, what set them apart was they have extensive transportation qualifications. They've done work for um, HRT here in Virginia, a similar project for them uh, with, with uh, great results. They've done it for several agencies throughout the country. And their primary focus is on local government, as well as, more importantly, transportation agencies. Great. Okay. Uh, Mr. Campbell, if I may? Yes. One of, the, one of the reasons why you're seeing this presented the way it is with the phased approach is because it's a, it allows us to do our due diligence to assess our current um, infrastructure, our current IT, the Microsoft, Microsoft Dynamics, and see what the best value is. I. My, in my rainbows and unicorns world, I'm not an IT person. I'm still hopeful that the Microsoft Dynamics platform will be our solution. We're just not, you know, knowledgeable about all of its different aspects and that Plant Moran can help us through it. Uh, chances are that it will require some more uh, money and uh, we're not going to commit to spending millions of dollars until we do our due diligence. And this phase approach allows us to do due diligence about assessing exactly what our needs are to become more efficient and effective business processes. And uh, Rob is, uh, he's the knowledgeable one. So I, you know, we're leaning heavily on his knowledge about how to implement this in a. In HRT, does, I'm sorry, go ahead. Does no, HRT, you say, is using them as well right now? Uh, they use them for this this type of project. That project is, is now since been completed, but they did use them in the past for this project, correct? They were very pleased with it. We, we received positive responses back from them. Okay, any further questions or comments on this? Can I have a motion to approve this expenditure? Are we approving the whole, we're approving 510, understanding that um, the first uh, 
contract will be 142. You're approving a contract for 510, which gives them phase one and phase two. We are currently issuing a purchase order for 142, which covers our, our phase one work. At that point, then we will have to come back to the board for the remainder of the phase two project, which will be plant and Moran, as well as whatever that other solution is. Okay. What period of time would this encompass one and two? We anticipate phase one to take eight months. Phase two is unknown at this time. It all depends on how phase two is structured. If phase two is structured as an enhancement to Great Plains, that may be a shorter lift than completely implementing a new system. So the phase two time frame is unknown at this time. So implementing a new system would then require not just consulting, but uh, but some capital expense for software, correct? We anticipate both of those would, yes, because if we have to do Great Plains, we may not have to purchase the software because we own the licenses of the software, but to enable all those systems and modify them to fit our business processes, we would need someone that is a Great Plains expert to implement that software. Um, we already have on our roadmap and our capital budget for the additional funds for this, and that's in the process, but the funds that we have right now covers the phase one. All right, can I have a motion to approve this? So moved. Second. Um, any further comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, it is no opposition, just an abstention um, because I, I had to step away and, and didn't hear the full conversation. Thanks, George. Um, it, Mr. Taggart, you, uh, your uh, usually competent and detailed self has exceeded itself today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, and you have another one, Hastis Annual Maintenance and Support Renewal. Yes, sir. So Jero Hastis is our centralized scheduling and planning software that we utilize at GRTC extensively. It handles the, uh, this is what planning and scheduling uses to create and modify all of our routes, do all of our bookings. This is the software that handles the actual bookings with the drivers themselves, the operators, as well as uh, handling our payroll system. So it's one of our core systems to the uh, uh, to GRTC. Every year we pay annual software maintenance and support. This gives us our technical support, all of our updated releases, as well as a block of hours to be used as needed for modifies, tweaks, training, whatever it may be. Um, so that time of, has come again to renew that agreement. The 2021 maintenance support fees are $156,710, which is a 4% increase over last year. That's just an increase that uh, Jero has applied to it, and that is the lowest amount that we can negotiate down on this increase. Um, this will be funded with federal uh, and local funds. And so the recommendation to the board is that you authorize the CEO to issue a purchase order to Jero not to exceed $156,710. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments on this? Could I have a motion to approve it, please? So moved. Second. Thanks, been moved and seconded. That, uh, that we authorize the CEO to issue a purchase order to Jero for the Hastis um, maintenance, uh, not to exceed 156,710. All in favor say aye, please. Aye. aye. All opposed, the motion is carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Taggart. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, Ms. Rose Pace, Operator Recruitment Media Buy. You're gonna have another um, hot set of uh, uh, videos coming up, huh? Yes, sir. DRTC's Board of Directors approved the marketing operating budget for fiscal year 21, which included a total of $333,000 for GRTC marketing efforts and continues to be used for operator recruitment. After the fall 2020 run, we still have $200,000 available for media buys. The same operator stories updated and aired in October 2020 will appear in early 21 with the specific dates for each partner listed in your attachment. The October campaign sent 12,000 people to our employment page online, and as Tim reported, at least 49 applied, of which 13 attributed their application to the TV ads, 13 to our website, which could include ad links to our employment page, and a couple references to social media. As in recent media buys, these partners provide a balance of on-air and digital advertising placement. After reviewing the fall 2020 applicant data, we are shrinking the digital ad reach back to within an hour driving distance of GRTC. 
We are also continuing mobile app advertisements and streaming, as well as increasing our targeted email campaigns, which for reference will help us make that link between who is receiving an advertisement from us and then going to the application page. This run, we are increasing our focus on jobs board style ad placements with several partners. We obtained media by proposals from the following media partners where we will issue not to exceed purchase orders in the following amounts. CBS 6, 70,000, NBC 12, 65,000, Fox 35, 30,000, and then we've added WRIC 8, which is the ABC affiliate locally for 35,000. Total for the early 21 spend is $200,000. The recommendation is that the board of directors authorizes the purchase orders specified above in not to exceed amounts for each media partner in early 21. Mr. Chair, that concludes my statement. Thank you. Are there other comments, questions on this? <clears throat> if you haven't seen them, you need to look at them. They're great. And um, this is uh, an expenditure of money, um, particularly budgeted and appropriated in the in the FY 2021 budget. All right, uh, could I have a motion to approve this, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve this uh, uh, media buy. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, it's approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Rose Pace. Mr. Chairman, you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, I need to depart the meeting here just to let you know. Thank you, Danny. Um, blessings to you. All right, thanks. Bye. All right, financial report. <coughs> Ms. Bailey, is this you? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, the financial statements for the three months ending September 30th, 2020, start on page 50 and go through page 53 of your board packet. The first three pages reflect our operating activity for the three months ending September 30th, with the fourth page, our balance sheet, reflecting our financial position at September 30th, 2020. I will be covering the first two documents this morning. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to share my screen. I will begin on page 50, the budget variance report for the three months ended September 30th. This report details the monthly comparison of actual to budget for the first three months of our fiscal year. For the month of September, total revenues fell short of the budgeted expectations by $572,000. The total expenses for September were favorable by $409,000. This resulted in a net budget variance of 163,000. If I scroll down to the next page, page 51, our statement of income, you will see that although our change in net position for the month was a negative 163, we're still tracking favorably with a $683,000 variance. Overall, this $683,000 favorable variance is due to our COVID expenditures slowing down for the moment. This affects both our budgeted revenues and our budgeted expense. This is evident for the month of September with operating contributions being down by 599,000. And also wanna point out for the first time this year, all of our cost centers are favorable to budget in the amount of $409,000. The purchase of service Spectran continues to track with the most favorable variance of 744,000. This is due to um, the service not recovering as quickly as we had anticipated due to the um, COVID-19. And unless you have any questions, that ends my, um, ends my financial report for this month. So that shortfall in operating contributions. Um... Yes, sir. What that is, is that's down. Because basically when, when our expenses are high, we will be re requesting more money from the government, from our 
from our contributions. So since our expenses are down, we're not requesting as much money. And that would be from whom? All of our? Um... From all of our, yes, from the federal, from the CARES Act, from the uh, state and from their local. The, if I may, the the budget that we received uh, and that we budgeted for for Enrico, Richmond, and for um, for Chesterfield are are pretty static. We're trying to keep those because of the because of COVID and the changes that are coming on us with the CBTA. We made a commitment to keep them whole of their budgeted amount. So we are building them the, the holes that that I hate. To, I shouldn't use the word hole. It's not a hole. The the delta, the difference is being covered by the CARES Act funding. But we can only draw down that money when we spend it. So if our spending is favorable, then our drawdown will be unfavorable to balance that out. Um, and so it's not really a bad, it's a, it's a good news story to be unfavorable in this case, the budget, because it means that we're just not spending um, as fast and we don't need to spend as fast as we had thought we might with the ongoing COVID pa pandemic. So this is, this is good to be unfavorable to budget in this case. Thank you. Any further questions on this? Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Next, I think you have cash flow statement. Yes, sir. Um, the cash flow projection can be found on page 55 of the board packet. This report reflects our actual sources and uses of cash during the month of September, along with air projections of cash inflows and outflows through January 2021. And once again, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, to refresh your memory, we transferred 2.5 million from the reserve to our operating cash account in July. As shown on the report, we were able to pay back 1.5 million of the reserve in September. Due to the payment of three payrolls and two medical insurance invoices during October, along with lower than anticipated federal drawdowns for that month, we needed a transfer of 1.5 million into the reserve, I mean, into, into our operating account for the month of October. During November, we expect to return $1 million. I um, also want to make note that we have been in contact with the city of Richmond and we feel confident that their second quarter payment will be received before the end of November. The issue with their late first quarter payment was due to COVID implications along with the signing of the new contract. Uh, the second quarter is slightly late due to confusion on their end of a possible duplicate invoice. Uh, we appreciate the city of Richmond working with us to resolve the issues and in communication with them yesterday, we feel good going forward and that we have addressed all of our issues to ensure a seamless process from this point forward. Um, for December, you can see that we are projecting um, a low cash reserve for that month, but then projected for January, our cash seems to be flowing back in with their, um, with their contributions. So we should be able to return $1 million. Um, if I may, I'd like to point out that our federal drawdown expectations are conservative at the 2.3 a million per month. And without stealing Ms. Keisha Reed's thunder from her upcoming presentation, we are expecting a monthly increase of 150,000 on the state line um, in the near future. These two combined will enable us to pay back the reserve quicker. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you have any questions, um, uh, this ends my cash flow part for the month of September. All right, so thank you. This is, um, as you know, this is a, a new level of reporting um, in terms of cash flow that we're initiating here. So are there any questions about it? Um, it gives a good picture of, of uh, how these um, multiple income sources and, uh, and expenditures um, cross one another in our, in our life. Any, um, all right, thank you, Ms. Bailey, for that report. That's... Uh, yes. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, Tanya, Ms. Thompson, recent and upcoming procurements. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. On page 57 of your board packet, you will see there are currently nine projects 
on the current and ongoing procurements report. The four you approved today came off the list and four more were added. Three of those projects will be managed by our planning department. Those three projects are the purchase of shelters, a Willow Lawn Park and Ride study, and a project for the installation of landing pads at various bus stops in our system. The last addition is for a new elevator maintenance contract. And unless there are any questions, this ends my report. I have a couple of questions. The landing pads, is that the extension of the BRT um, pads? What is that? No, this is a project in coordination with VDOT. There was some funding that was given to us a, a while ago and um, Adrian can probably elaborate on it a little bit better than I. Um, Adrian, do you want to step in here and give more? Sure. Yeah, in 2016, we applied for um, grant funds for transit alternative program. Um, it's $150,000. So we are finally, after many iterations through the procurement process um, <laughs> with procurement and VDOT, we are hopefully at a point where we can get 35 landing pads. And they're all on the south side. Okay. Um, and the Willow Lawn Park and Ride Study, help me on that. Uh, we were working on that a year ago. Um, I know the building we were looking at got bought for two and a half million dollars by somebody. Um, what, it, what is this, Don? I'm going to also defer to Adrian on this one as well. <laughs> You want me to jump in, Julie, or do you want to address? Yes, please. Oh, please, Adrian. Thank you. Ms. Yes. Um, we did a scope of work um, coordinating with Henrico County and um, following kind of the report that was done by Plan RVA last year. Uh, Willow Lawn, of course, was one of the ones that was identified as a need. So working with the consultant, we hope to identify some sites that would work for GRTC that are aligned with the poles as well as um, our routes in that area and potential expansion if it does happen for maybe the pulse line or any other expansion in that area. So just so that we're ready, we're going to do some conceptual drawings um, that will range for um, whether it's a smaller site, depending on the parcel size or a bigger site. So if we do find one that works for us, we'll already have the information to move forward pretty fast, knowing that the market in that area uh, does go fast, so we have to have, be ready, ready to go. Yeah. Okay, that seems like a lot of money for that. Um, but anyway, hey, um, we need to do if it. If I may, Mr. If yeah. I may, Mr. Campbell, um, this money is dedicated from a grant that DRPT obtained for us through FHWA. Adrian's been working very, very closely with um, Enrico County on looking at this, and it does ex extend our range of options that we have since I've been here a little over a year, uh, been focused very closely on, in one area. We've done lots of studies and we, we continue to not be able to move forward. This extends some of that study area and will allow us to, to have a little bit more flexibility in advancing something um, instead of continuing the trend of study and then not be able to get the parcel we want and then study and not get the parcel we want. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Julie, uh, we, um, you and I approved some some expenditure during this last month. Does that get reported on here? I no, we're not. We, we're still getting our signatures. It should be uh, in the administrative office today. So I did not include that on the report for this month. But, You'll see next month. Well, I, I have basic rule that if I approve something um, on behalf of the board in an interim, then I like folks to know what we've done. Um, oh, uh, apologies, Mr. Campbell, because it, I think what Tanya is trying to say is because it actually hasn't been signed, it, while, while you have agreed to approve it, until you mm -hmm. actually have your signature on it, you haven't approved it, and that's why she's, uh, it's a technicality of timing, that it certainly will come to this board, but um, pending your signature. So you haven't got my physical signature to it yet, is that it? No, sir. Well, oh, well, be glad to give it to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. What was it? The uh, expenses for a change order for leadership training, um, as based on the email that Julie sent to you, it's in regards, we piloted a program for leadership training. 
I believe there were three executive staff members that were participated in the training. It went well. So we would like to continue and have some more of leadership participate in the training and maybe some managers as well. Okay. All right, fellow board members, um, I tentatively approve that. And it's, uh, it deals with uh, some leadership training that they felt was very successful. And they, they think it's gonna make them all hotter and stronger um, as we go forth into this next year. Any further questions? Thank you for your report, Tony. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Um, and finally, um, here an action item for state transit funding and GRTC capital plan approval. Keisha Reed. Good morning. Good morning. So I will briefly go over an update from our state spending, state funding. Okay. So I'll go over the state operation and capital funding. On November the 2nd, DRPT sent out notification to all agencies of their intent to support various projects. On December 9th, the CTV will be approving those, um, those options from the state. GRTC is receiving operating assistance of $11.7 million. This is 1.9 million more than FY20, and this is due to the ridership data. For capital assistance, they will be um, supporting $4.5 million in projects, which is actually supporting our scenario one. So some background in September, staff approached the board with three scenarios for our FY21 spending. Scenario one was all of our FY21 projects being going forward with a full 68% state match. Scenario two was GRTC staff moving forward with all the projects with no state support. And scenario three, which was approved by the board where GRTC would only move forward with state of good repair and safety projects. Since the state has matched all projects for FY21, GRTC will move forward with scenario one, which is all the projects with a 68% state match. This slide recaps what those projects were. The first two, security and state of good repair. Those are the ones we were already going to move forward with without a state match. But now that we have a state match, we can include business improvements, which is several clever enhancements, and also our service improvements, which is clever vision. Staff is returning to the board on today asking for approval to move forward with scenario one as opposed to scenario three. Scenario one is inclusive of all projects in the FY21 capital plan with a state match of 68% as opposed to scenario three, which only entail state of good repair and security efforts. Any all right. Um, thank you for that report. That's um, good news, isn't it? That the yes. state is fully funding uh, our best uh, best case scenario there. Um, yes. Any other thoughts, comments? If I may, Mr. Campbell, just to to confirm that with uh, if you do approve us advancing with the capital plan, these projects would still come to you for approval of the contracts once they go through procurement. So this is just giving us. Um, the guidance that yes, you agree with this plan. We'll go out, we'll get the bids, and come back, and then you'll actually award the specific contracts um, as they're they finish procurement. All right. Any further questions or comments? That's great news. Um, so, could I have a motion to approve um, our proceeding with uh, with this uh, scenario three? Um, as uh, because the state is in fact doing its full funding. Motion moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we proceed in this way. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, it's passed. And Ms. Reed, thank you very much for that um, that report. That's, uh, that's really good news. Thanks. All right. 
Uh, Chief Executive Officer's report. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, so I'll start on a, I guess the standard of talking about COVID activities. You heard Tim talk of, uh, already that we had no new cases of COVID in the entire month of October. Uh, we did have one new case in very early November that had to do with a case amongst our contractor staff that appears to be family and not work related at this time based on our contact tracing. Um, the good news is from that that uh, the, the symptoms were mild um, and that we've had no other cases reported in November. So even though we're seeing a rise in uh, the state, even though we have stronger restrictions put in place by our governor, we are still seeing that the measures we have enacted for the past eight months are continue, continuing to be effective and that our staff continues to be really good in complying with those measures to keep themselves and their own families um, safe as much as, as we could, as much as we can hope. Um, but as I mentioned earlier dur during Tim's report, this is taking a toll on our staff. Um, yes, more people are getting used to wearing masks uh, across the country in, in this region. Yes, it's becoming the new normal, but I still hear a lot of complaints, too many complaints uh, about people not faithfully wearing them, not seriously wearing them throughout their entire trip on our buses, and our operators bearing the brunt of that by having to enforce mask wearing or uh, focus on driving. And that's a, a truly difficult balance when their attention needs to be on the road, but at the same time, when someone behind them is not wearing a mask to be able to observe that and pull over and then make everyone on the bus late while that person uh, complies with putting their mask back on their face or wait until dispatch supervisor or police comes and removes that person. Uh, in the meantime, they're breathing on the bus around everyone else. Um, and in many cases, they're being, while they may or may not be physically violent, they're being very verbally abusive and verbally violent towards our operators, and it's un unacceptable. I have asked our supervisors and our operations team to increase the support. We'll be also be asking for the police where possible to increase the support. That level of rudeness um, is not only unacceptable, but cannot be tolerated on our system. Uh, for the support of our operators, as well as for the rest of our riders. Um, it does affect our morale, as I said, and it affects our absenteeism issues. Uh, while we have people out because of legitimate illnesses, um, it makes it harder for people to come to work, even though it's their job, when they know they have to face that level of abuse. So again, we're doing everything we can to give them the support through training, de-escalation training. We'll have more um, uh, uh, initiatives to have supervisors and police assist in getting this through and whatever kind of outreach we can do and, and messaging to support the idea that masks must be worn, not just on the bus, but getting on the bus, leaving the bus, and during the entire time on the bus. Uh, the good thing that I, we're seeing is that while we saw this early in the COVID uh, pandemic, we're seeing again as we, we reach towards Thanksgiving, community organizations are reaching out to give gifts, Thanksgiving gifts to our operators who are our most visible frontline staff. Uh, we're trying to match that for the rest of our frontline staff, our mechanics and our bus cleaners who don't tend to be quite as visible to the public. And these gestures of thanks and appreciation from the community to our team, they do help morale, they, they help support. And um, so any other community members who can find even small gestures to stand out in the yard again with the signs to say thank you, to say thank you when they get on and off the bus, to to uh, to show their appreciation to our essential staff and our frontline workers. Uh, I cannot express how much that is appreciated by our team. So I I want to just put that out there to say, um, show your love, please. Again, we appreciate the governor's putting in stricter compliance measures. I know that they are not popular, and I know there's many people who do not agree with it. Uh, these restrictions, however, we do have, unfortunately, uh, uh, an exemption from some of these. While the, the governor's new rules say that you cannot have more than 25 people in a meeting now or in, a, in an event, uh, unfortunately, we do still have more than that on our buses. And uh, under the exemptions, we're allowed to have more than 25 people on a bus. 
as long as they're wearing their masks and they're using their hand sanitizer and they're, um, they're complying with limited conversations or no conversations or no phone use on the bus, they will remain safe on, the, on transit. And we've seen that across the, the nation and we've seen that across the world, that transit is safe when people comply uh, and there haven't been any uh, COVID cases or clusters related to using transit. So very happy about that. Um, while I would love to be able to limit the crowd in our buses to less than 25 people, unfortunately to do so would create a significant barrier to transit and a specific barrier to low-income households reaching essential services. So um, again, knowing that we're doing everything we can to keep people safe, and knowing that our core services are so needed by our economically distressed communities and by our low-income riders, uh, we will continue to do everything we can to keep service out there. Uh, to keep our staff fully employed, to keep them fully safe. And whenever we see better measures to have more protection in place, we will continue to implement those. On a, a bittersweet message along that same line, DC, I just saw in the papers just last night uh, that the DC system is looking to buy out around 1,400 members of their team, uh, their transit team up there. Um, and that's based on the, the drop in ridership. So much of their ridership is based on the commute shed. And many of those riders that no longer need to commute, they can telework, are not getting on the bus. So their service um, is, doesn't have the financial input that they require with the fare box. Um, they don't need to put that service out for people who aren't riding. So in order to protect their service and to remain, remain fiscally solvent, they're looking to, according to the news press, I haven't talked to myself, uh, buy out approximately 1,400 members of their team. While that is um, horrible news in some ways, uh, I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm hoping we can take advantage of that. Uh, 1,400 members of people buying out who are retiring early, who are professional bus drivers and professional mechanics, when we have a shortfall, hopefully some of them live in the south side of D.C., closer to Richmond, and we can pick them up and fill in our ranks uh, to be able to quickly um, put in the operators that we not not only to fill the hole that we have now because we are about 15 short but also that some of them we can start pulling in to look for the growth in the system that we expect with the cvta money in fy 22 for the growth of the system so i'm very excited oh that's a bad word about their loss um of the opportunity that we have to be able to give people work here and to support service here and of course um Sorry that any transit agency is suffering through this. Uh, on a different note, everything is not uh, the same as normal. In some cases, we are continuing to improve. Uh, we have two new committees that are being launched this month and next month. One of those is the GRTC Regional Capital Plan Group, and the other is the Transit Center Downtown Need and Location. These are being led internally by Adrian, and she'll report out on these in future months to give you an update about where they're going. But just a quick update so that you know what's going on out in the community. The Regional Capital Plan Group is, and both of these groups actually were requested by the City of Richmond, and so we're advancing them in coordination with the city partners. The Capital Plan Group will be an advisory group that will help GRTC support and complement projects that are being led by our local partners and vice versa, where they can support and complement the projects that we are leading. Um, it will also help us develop the funding strategies to support GRTC as we uh, look to continue our state of good repair needs and also to put out more improvements to transit accessibility, multimodal connectivity um, by targeting available state and federal vehicle and infrastructure grants. Um, so this will also allow us to streamline these projects into the plan RVA TIP and possibly into the CVTA project prioritization process where some of these projects might show that they have some regional significance. Um, so very excited about that. The first group, the, the regional plan um, capital group, I expect them to meet, uh, first meet in early November, early December. The members of it will focus on mostly staff level, senior staff level participants from GRTC, the city of Richmond and RICO and Chesterfield with, uh, with ride, ride finders to really focus in on where our service currently exists. As that service expands regionally, um, other members will be invited uh, or if, they're, if they ask volunteer to participate in this, this regional capital group. The other uh, uh, group that is coming forward is a downtown transfer 
stakeholder group, um, and it's a, a group that is going to be comprised of Richmond stakeholders with some regional input to act as a steering group to identify the priorities and, a, and hopefully a key location that, that can be supported by the city and by the downtown stakeholders for a permanent home for a downtown Richmond transfer center that will focus on a transit-centric mobility and connectivity in that downtown area. Uh, the city will meet virtually on November 19th to hear more about the needs for the transit center downtown and the background for it, and also to, to help to start defining what more data needs um, we should be collecting, what kind of outreach we need to have, and next steps in the process. Uh, very quickly, the, the members who have been initially tagged, this isn't a final list or a complete list, it's an initial list of people we're reaching out to, include members of GRTC, planning, grants, and facility staff, uh, Dirona Moore Clark with the City of Richmond, Todd Urey from Enrico County, Barb Smith from Chesterfield, who are our key counterpo uh, counterparts with the, our stakeholders, uh, Jack Berry with the Convention Center, um, our own board members, Ben Campbell and George Braxton, who uh, represent the board, but also the City of Richmond. We also have um, uh, council members, Addison and Newbill, uh, we're asking if they would also participate because of their connection to downtown Richmond and their advocacy for transit. Uh, we're looking at uh, other members of the City of Richmond leadership team and economic development and other areas to participate as they know some of the activities and growth that are going on in downtown or that are planned to go on uh, downtown. And then we have other stakeholder groups that aren't necessarily transit or downtown focused um, but do have a focus, a focus there, because that's not their entire focus, and that would include um, the RVA Rapid Transit, the Community Foundation, members of the Realtors Group Housing, Chamber of Commerce, Plan RVA, Venture Richmond, uh, to give a broader focus of the needs of transit and the connectivity of transit, not just downtown, but through the region. Um, and it, it's, I'm very hopeful that this stakeholder group will help to identify that home for a downtown transfer center and create some champions and stakeholder groups to get that support we need to plan for it, fund it, get it constructed here in the next several years. So it's an exciting move forward. And as it actually uh, develops and forms and moves forward, you'll be hearing more from Adrian about, about what's happening with it. And if there are members of the other members of the community or stakeholder groups that should be part of it, there'll probably be subgroups to this that will have technical components that they'll need inputting back in and we, we welcome everyone in the process. On another note, uh, I know that we all are watching, or I am watching very closely, what's going on with federal and state legislation. Um, there is different actions going on that may or may not lead to changes or additions or protections necessary for transit funding. Those are being reported out by the national group, APTA, uh, and by the state group, VTA. I continue to work very closely with both those groups and watch it to make sure that uh, our position and our finances are protected and legislation and changes in the federal and state level. On a, a related note, because it has to do with VTA, I'll be sending out a link later today. We'll put it out on social media. I think some of it's been out there already about a campaign that VTA has put forward called Faces of Transit. And um, I, I would play it today, but um, I'm going to send out the link instead. I, I hope that all of you have just a few minutes to watch it. It features the different transit agencies from across the state, and it features one of our own operators who talks about transit uh, from an operations perspective as an operator and, and what it's meant to her. But it, it also talks about uh, the different other components of transit and the ridership perspective and um, the community perspective. It, it really is a wonderful tool to help people understand all the different components of transit and how it serves our riders and our communities. So I'll send that link out. It really, when I watched it yesterday for the first time, I immediately, in the middle of it, typed to Carrie, said, we got to get our hands on this and send it out. And, and she did. She got it for us, and so we'll send that out today. So uh, I'm coming to the end here. It would I want to point out how proud we are of Ride Finders for the awards that their team is winning. And just recall to us as we're going through such a hard year that GRTC is such an exceptional team, that the Pulse was an award-winning BRT system and continues to be a source of pride and the backbone of our system. 
our system just redesigned from two years ago that Adrian talked about a little bit today and, and we're monitoring closely to continue to improve, uh, was a model for this region to attract new riders and to grow the system and, and used as a national, it was recognized nationally as such as national transfer ridership dropped. And I believe that that redesign is probably the one of the reasons why we have held up so well through COVID because it is focused on our core mission and our core needs to serve this region. Um, I believe that not only will you continue to see awards come out of ride finders for their staff, for their professional professionalism and work, but I've also heard early words that GRTC staff has been nominated for some awards that I, I hope we can announce here shortly. Uh, GRTC marketing communications team also won an award through VTA for their work on Chesterfield and they, they continue to have award winning work come out of there. Um, and I, the new reporting that Adrian is putting out for the KPIs will add more transparency and will continue to improve on what I believe is an exceptional system and an exceptional team uh, that has just performed so admirably through con seriously adverse conditions in 2020. Uh, and with that note of pride, I'm going to end my report by hoping that everyone has a very safe November and a very happy, if socially distanced, Thanksgiving. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, if there are no questions, that concludes the CEO's report for November. Thank you. Any questions um, or comments for, uh, for Ms. Tim? Um, my only comment is that I... Uh, too, I'm very proud of, uh, of what we're doing. I'm very grateful for our CEO. Um, I'm, I am grateful for the for this board and this, the experience and knowledge that's present on it. And um, I'm very prayerful that as we move into this next year, the um, significant opportunities that are presented by the development of the CBTA and the potential for really beginning to have actual coverage over our actual metropolitan city um, can continue to expand and the support for public transit expand. I, the, the contrast between what's happening to us numerically and what's happening to DC and, uh, and other major metropolitan areas is quite interesting. Um, and um, as uh, Julie said, it's painful. I hope we can pick up some drivers though. And, um, because we've got we've got new routes to run, and uh, and we're going to need more people to do that. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, have a motion to go into executive session. Mr. Milliken. Sorry, I had to minimize something there so I could read the entire motion. Um, I move that the board hold a closed meeting pursuant to section 2.2-3711A29 of the Code of Virginia to discuss the status and terms of a collective bargaining agreement because discussion in an open session would adversely affect GRTC's bargaining position. Can I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded that we move into executive session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's been passed. Mr. Taggart, and you can put this. Hi. Mr. Oh, Chairman, give me one second and I'll move us over. Sorry, Julie, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Rob, I didn't mean to. I was just going to ask that Tim and Cheryl please stay for the executive session.
And we are now live. Whereas the Board of Directors of GRTC has convened and closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the Board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certifying resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Witness the following vote of board members. Ben Campbell? Aye. George Braxton? Aye. Uh, Gary Armstrong? Aye. Eldridge Coles? Aye. And Ian Milliken? Aye. All right, uh, is there any further business for this meeting? If not, the 